Good day. The meeting between um, US Secretary of State Antony Blinken and Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov has taken place in the President Wilson Hotel in Geneva. It lasted all of one hour and 30 minutes, and it seems to have been a frankly bizarre end to what is, in diplomatic terms, a very bizarre and strange week. Now, over the course of the detailed negotiations which took place last week between the Russians and Americans in Geneva, with the follow-up talks in Brussels with NATO and in Vienna with the OSCE, the Western powers, the United States first and foremost, promised the Russians that they would provide a written response to the Russian proposals set out in their two draft treaties by the end of this week. Those Russian proposals call for legally binding security guarantees for Russia, the essence of which is a pledge by the United States and the NATO powers that there will be no further eastward expansion of NATO whatsoever, including uh, with respect, obviously, to Ukraine and also a complete dismantling of the physical infrastructure, the military infrastructure that NATO has created in the former countries of the Warsaw Pact, contrary to the promises that the Russians were given back in, 1990, uh, in, in the 1990s when, the, when NATO began, did begin to expand eastward, contrary to its previous promises. Well, the Americans promised that they would come up with a detailed written response this week. They haven't done so. And at the end of this week, um, instead of that written response being provided to the Russians, Blinken urgently telephoned Lavrov and asked to meet him in Geneva. And uh, at the end of a whistle-top tour by Blinken in, of Europe. And he met Lavrov in Geneva, and he had to tell Lavrov that those written responses to, that had been promised were not yet ready. He apparently did promise Lavrov that they would be provided next week sometime. Perhaps more usefully from a Russian point of view, uh, Blinken also seems to have recommitted the United States to the Minsk Agreement, to the implementation of the Minsk Agreement. In my last video, I said that Lavrov seems to be providing the Americans with some sort of off-ramp here, in which the United States acts to try to persuade Ukraine to do that which it has consistently refused to do up to now, which is to open direct negotiations with the leaders of the two republics of the Donbass, the Donetsk and Lugansk People's Republics, with a view to implementing the Minsk Agreement. The Minsk Agreement required direct negotiations between these Ukrainian parties. It sought uh, through those negotiations an agreement for autonomy for the Donbass. It sought an agreement for federalization or decentralization of Ukraine, a new constitution for Ukraine, a new new elections ending in the creation of a national unity government. Now, Ukraine has consistently refused to implement these political provisions of the Minsk agreement. The Russians have become extremely exasperated that the Germans and the French who brokered the Minsk Agreement, have been refusing to apply pressure on Ukraine to implement the Minsk Agreement. The Russians have now told the Americans that they must do so instead. And there are growing hints that the United States very gradually and very reluctantly might ever so slowly, ever so uncertainly, begin to be, start to shift towards that position. Um, there are reports that President Biden, over the course of a telephone call with President Zelensky of Ukraine some weeks ago, uh, apparently told 
Zelensky that Ukraine must recognize that a grant of autonomy to the Donbass is absolutely essential and that he apparently also told Zelensky over the course of that telephone call that Ukraine must be prepared for the fact that it is not going to join NATO anytime soon. And in fact, uh, Biden repeated that uh, last point over the course of that disastrous and chaotic press conference, which I discussed in my last video. So it seems just possible that Blinken came along with some assurances to the Russians at this meeting in Geneva that indeed the uh, United States would start to become more involved in trying to get the Ukrainians to negotiate seriously on the basis of the Minsk agreement. That, however, seems to have been the full total, <laughs> the full sum of what was achieved in Geneva. A, a, a promise to Lavrov that these responses, these written responses, would be provided to the Russians next week, even though they haven't been provided this week, and some suggestions, some mumbling suggestions, that the United States might be prepared to come forward and do something with respect to the Minsk agreement. One does wonder, frankly, why Blinken needed to meet Lavrov to, to explain all of this to him. Why he couldn't have just told Lavrov all of this over the phone. Why the United States couldn't have provided a preliminary written response to the Russians over the course of this week and told the Russians that a fuller response would be provided next week. It all looks incredibly rushed and incredibly hurried. And I have to say, it does give a sense of extraordinary muddle and confusion on the part of the Western powers. And perhaps a sense of how madcap this whole thing has been, a very sense of how bizarre, in fact, it has all been. It, you can perhaps go to a place which is absolutely unswerving in its loyalty to the Western position, and which is unswerving in its hostility to Russia, and to look at the way in which the BBC, in which has been covering the story of this meeting between Lavrov and Blinken in Geneva. And not just that meeting, but the whole really weird diplomacy that the United States has been engaged in this week. And I'm just going to read the BBC story in full. Obviously, one has to understand the political biases. And it's a piece by Anthony Zucker, who is, shall we say, somebody who is always willing to accept the worst of the Russians. He was an enthusiastic believer in the Russiagate collusion conspiracy, for example, which turned out to be obviously completely wrong. But anyway, this is how he reports Blinken's trip to Europe. US Secretary of State Antony Blinken hopped on a plane to Europe this week to do three, three things. He wanted to assure Ukraine the US would support it in the face of Russian military threats, rally support among US allies for a unified aggressive response if needed, and sit down with his Russian counterpart to find a diplomatic solution, or at least show the US was not giving up on diplomacy. It was clearly a hastily arranged trip. Now, let's just think that through. Um, it, that introduction by Zuko, by the BBC, I think explains what the original game plan was. The original game plan was reassure the Ukrainians, hammer out a united response with the NATO allies, come up with a tough sanctions package, confront Lavrov with it in Geneva. In other words, tell the Russians basically to get lost because they're dealing with a united West 
Well, we'll see how it didn't turn out that way. And I continue with what Zucker had to say. U.S. officials had only two days' notice to prepare a day full of meetings with Ukrainian President Zelensky and Foreign Minister Kuleba, as well as with concerned staff at the U.S. Embassy. Interesting that the staff at the U.S. Embassy are concerned, but that's the embassy in Kiev, obviously. But anyway, to continue, throughout, Mr. Blinken hammered the same message. The U.S. stood by Ukraine. Russia had a stark choice between dis- diplomacy and dialogue on one hand and conflict and consequences on the other. By the end of that long first day, it seemed like the US was making progress. Then, President Biden did a rhetorical belly flop in the middle of the diplomatic pool overnight. During a nearly two hour press conference, he said the US would surely argue with its allies over how to respond to a minor incursion by Russia into Ukraine and that he thought it was probable that Russia would go in to Ukraine. Those views left heads nodding in foreign policy circles. But when it comes to diplomacy, some truths are best left unsaid. In other words, Biden let the, ba- la- let the truth slip out. There are disagreements within NATO. Exactly the impression, the opposite impression of the one that Blinken wanted to give. And I would add that um, on top of all of this, um, Blink- Biden also said over the course of that news conference that Ukraine was not going to join NATO anytime soon. News deeply unwelcome to the Ukrainians and which at a time when the United States supposedly is supporting Ukraine might also from a Ukrainian point of view have been best left unsaid. Anyway, to continue again with this article in the BBC by Mr. Zucker. The next day, Mr. Blinken was meeting US allies from Germany, the UK and France in Berlin. But he had to spend most of the day clarifying Mr. Biden's comments instead of polishing the appearance of allied unity in the face of Russian intransigence. Absolutely correct. And I would add that there were reports circulating a few days before that Blinken was preparing to make a strong speech in Berlin, presumably responding forcefully to the Russians. And interestingly, that strong speech in Berlin never materialised. To continue again. Meanwhile, back in Ukraine, President Zelensky was firing off snarky tweets and other government officials fretted that Mr. Biden had given a green light to a Russian invasion. Back in Berlin, during a joint press conference with German Foreign Minister Annalena Baerbock, both diplomats talked up the strength of the yet-to-be-detailed sanctions that loomed if Russia attacked. Neither, however, seemed interested in discussing whether suspending the Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline from Russia to Germany was a possibility. Energy sanctions would hit Russia's national pocketbook the hardest, but seem unlikely. Europe relies on that Russian natural gas, and Mr. Biden is politically sensitive to rush to rising petrol prices in the US. The rest of the squad, quad, that's the other US allies, had issues too. France's Emmanuel Macron seems intent on pursuing a separate diplomatic strategy with Russia's Vladimir Putin. Plain spotters were quick to note the longer route around France and Germany that British cargo flights had to take to bring short-range anti-tank missiles to Ukraine this week. That, by the way, is the key point here. These anti-tank missiles that Britain is supplying are very light They're actually useless in terms of what they could do in the event of a Russian invasion. They were not intended to provide Ukraine with any degree of military support. 
they were intended to provide Ukraine with a sign of British diplomatic support. But the fact that the British cargo planes delivering these missiles had to skirt around France and Germany instead of indicating the solid support which exists for Ukraine simply highlighted again the divisions within NATO on this topic. Then again to continue with the BBC. The US and its allies were talking a good game but the Russians had to be at least somewhat encouraged by the way the week was playing out. And then the but well so it all the plan things aren't going according to plan the russians must be watching all of this and telling themselves well the americans and nato can't get their act together and then of course we have the discussion by zuka of the meeting between lavrov and blinken the li the bilateral meeting between mr blinken and russia's lavrov on friday was a spectacle at the historic President Wilson Hotel on the banks of a windswept Lake Geneva in Switzerland, Russian and American reporters jostled for position. Eventually, Mr. Lavrov and Mr. Brinklin Blinken made opening remarks seated across from each other at two long sets of tables adorned with pink and green bouquets. Mr. Lavrov said he hoped for concrete answers to our concrete pr proposals, including demands that NATO will never expand to former Soviet nations like Ukraine. Mr. Blinken, for his part, repeated that Russian aggression would prompt a united, swift and severe response. After the meeting, both sides said little progress had been made, but little, si but little had been expected. And then this is the BBC's, or to be more precise, Mr. Zuka's summary. Both the sides promised to keep the dialogue going and left open the possibility of a future meeting between Mr. Biden and Mr. Putin. In fact, Biden himself floated that possibility over the course of his press conference and I suspect that over the next couple of weeks we're going to see frantic US diplomacy trying to get some kind of summit meeting organised though I suspect a rather more controlled summit meeting than the previous one between Biden and Putin in which Biden was manoeuvred by Putin into negotiating around the topic of Russia's legally de desire for legally binding security guarantees, something which I suspect many people in the United States, uh, in the US government, probably didn't want. But then to continue again with what uh, Mr. Zucker at the BBC has to say, he says the following. But in, the way, in a way, the spectacle is already a win for Russia, regardless of how the crisis is resolved. Russian movements have prompted a week of furious activity on the part of the Americans and their allies at the time when the United States would much rather be focusing on what it views as an era-defining competition with an ascendant China. Instead, the high-stakes negotiations in Geneva harken back to a time decades past. Russia is, for the moment, again the centre of global attention. Mr Biden suggested as much in a speech in Berlin on Thursday afternoon. After detailing what he viewed as the long history of Russian deceit and broken promises, he said he said it sometimes seemed like Russia wanted to return to the days of the Cold War. We hope not, but if Putin chooses to do so, he'll be met with the same determination, the same unity uh, that past generations of leaders and citizens brought to bear to advance peace, to advance freedom, to advance dignity across Europe and around the world. As he heads back to Washington, it's hard to say what, if anything, has changed in the three days of crisis diplomacy.
both sides are still talking, but talk without results only goes so far. Well, there you go. Week of frantic diplomacy, much heat and motion from the American side. The Russians have sit, sat back and watched. They watched the US position, the NATO position, start to disintegrate. They see that the sanctions are increasingly looking ever less substantive and ever less threatening that people had initially suggested. And they also see that the United States is struggling to come up with responses to their demands for legally binding security guarantees, but have been forced to the negotiating table and are now having to promise that they will indeed come up with those responses. And we see that the United States, instead of walking away from the table, instead of doing what many people thought that Blinken was going to do, he was going to make this great speech in Berlin with the Allies united behind him, go and meet Lavrov, tell Mac Mac Lavrov to, you know, go away and uh, uh, um, the United States, Europe, we're all united against you. We've nothing to talk up with you about. Instead, he's been forced to come back and promise Lavrov, promise the Russians that these written responses are going to be provided after all. By the way, the fact that the United States is taking so long to come up with its, these written responses, remember, it's had these draft Russian proposals in its hands for weeks, the fact that it's been forced to, to do this shows that the Americans are in a weak position, but it also shows that there are divisions and disagreements, possibly within the US government, but perhaps more practically between the United States and its European allies about how to respond to these Russian proposals. So we see a fracturing position, a weakening position, weak signs of a weakening of resolve on the part of the United States and its allies. Signs which explain why Lavrov seems to come away from this meeting with Blinken, looking, to be frank about it, rather pleased with himself. And, of course, we also see how the United States may, as I said, be shifting ever so slowly, ever so gradually towards that position which it has wanted to avoid taking of trying to start to edge the Ukrainians towards negotiating on the basis of the Minsk agreement, negotiating inevitably with the leaders of the Donbass with a view to bringing this conflict in Ukraine finally to an end. Well, this is nowhere near finished. As I said, there's going to be more diplomacy over the next few days. There's going to be more meetings. There's going to be those written responses. There's probably going to be another Biden-Putin summit. That That's not by any means certain. The Russians are playing hard to get on that one. They're keeping the Americans guessing, they're keeping the Europeans guessing, they're keeping everybody worried. There's been another long piece in the Financial Times about how on energy, the Russians have the Europeans over a barrel, so to speak. Uh, and we see that the Russians are playing this out. They're playing, if you like, a game of wait and see. They've made their position clear. They're waiting to see whether the West will crumble. From a Russian point of view, you could almost say that their current tactic at the moment, their diplomatic tactic, is, well, everything comes to him who waits. We've got the Americans running around. We have Blinken flying from one city to another. We have the Americans making all the mistakes, making all the blunders unable to come up with a clear position, their allies are in disagreement with them, their sanctions packages are starting to unravel. Let's just wait and let's just see and eventually in time, might take a little time, might take 
more than a few weeks, perhaps even a few years, but eventually we will get all of what we want. As that famous expression says, everything comes to him who waits. And at the moment, the Russians seem able and willing to wait. Thank you for joining me for this program today. I look forward to you joining me again for future programs, both on this channel and on our main channel, The Duran, where I do programs with my colleague and friend, Alex Christoforu. Please also remember to join us on Locals, our other main platform where um, I do live streams every Wednesday at, uh, uh, at 1400 Eastern Standard Time, 1900 London Time, and where um, much of our community, our thriving community there, publish lots of informative um, content and also um, you can join and be part of that community. You can interact with me in the, my live streams. You can publish content yourself. And of course, we are also present on multiple other platforms, BitChute, Library, Rumble, Odyssey, SuperU, and all the rest. You can support us via pay, uh, Patreon and Subscribestar. You can also support us by going to our shop and buying the amazing things that you will find there. Our magic mugs, our hats, our hoodies, our sweatshirts, our t-shirts, and all the rest. And of course, please remember to check your subscription to this channel and to tick the like button if you've liked this video. Thank you for joining me again today. I look forward to you joining me again soon. And until then, have a very good day.